progress. Okay, today's staff we're going to be learning um, is Yevamo Yudalid. Today's staff is sponsored by Nancy Kaladni in honor of her daughter-in-law and Chavruta Lisa Kaladni on her birthday and in honor of all the men and women of the Hadron community. Mazal Tov, Lisa. Um, okay, we're going to get started from the end of where we ended yesterday, which is really toward the end of Yudgimel Amubet. We still have quite a bunch of lines from there. What I want to point out is I actually was noticing that Andaf Yud Gimel here is when we all of a sudden we're going to get totally off topic. <coughs> It'll be connected to our Mishnah, but into a very interesting topic that started from our Mishnah about Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel in terms of their different opinions. And it reminds me in Erevin, which is interesting because Yavamot and Erevin are kind of similar in their level of difficulty. If you remember, Andaf Yud Gimel of Erevin was the famous sugya of Elu ve'elu divrei Elohim chayim, and that every, right, that their words and their words are all the true words of God. And very interesting in terms of diversity of opinions and the same kind of idea here. And we're going to get off into a nice digression into a different topic, which will make it a little bit lighter for us. Um, and here goes. Okay. okay, so we start from the words Tanan Hatam. They're going to quote a Mishnah Megillah. Okay, we're just coming off of Purim. So you'll hopefully relate to this whole thing. Um, the Mishnah there said, first Mishnah in Megillah, which you'll likely remember, <coughs> the Megillah is read on multiple days. Some of the commentaries, and it seems to me that that's the shot here, although there are differences of opinion here, think that what we're talking about is not so much the Yud Aleph, Yud Bet, Yud Gimel, Yud Yamat, but Yud Dalitav, and the fact that there's Purim and there's Shushan Purim. And in fact, having just gone through it, right, it's very confusing. You know, I remember I... I my kids went to Jerusalem on Friday and, you know, almost like forgetting there was going to be Shushan Purim there, you know, is it, like you put it out of your mind, really, because, oh, it's, you know, and that it, it, it's really weird. Like we have two different holidays going on for different people. There's something a little bit strange about it. And that's exactly what Rish Lakish is bothered by. Amarle Rish Lakish the Rabbi Yochanan. Ikre kan lo go to do, lo tasua gudot a gudot. Isn't this a problem? Doesn't this make our religion into different factions? We don't want different factions. Now, of course, we know there's many different factions. And we're, it's already way beyond our our, our um, ability. You know, we're, we're way beyond. But in those days, there was more of a centrality of authority. And they said, this is like having, you know, some people doing one thing and some people doing something else. How is this possible? We're not going to actually really get an answer to this question. But Rabbi Yochanan is going to question him from a bunch of different directions. First, the Gemara is going to go off a little bit on its own. This isn't Rabbi Yochanan speaking. The Gemara is going to say, wait a minute. What's this loted go to do, by the way? Okay, so if you look, I brought it on the sheet. It comes from Dvarim Perek Yudalid, chapter 14, verse 1 and 2. Banim atem you are the sons of God. Loted go to do, the lotasimu korchaben enechem lamet. Okay, you shouldn't. The second one is like shave off your hair. For the dead, like do something that shows, you know, something destructive to your body. Or lo to do seems to be understood as don't cut, make cuts in your body, something like that. Don't destroy your body, mutilate your body in being upset about someone who died. And then it says, Ki am You're a special people. You can't just mutilate your bodies. So the Gemara says, what are you talking about? Rish Lakish, lo to do is don't make agudot, agudot. That's that's not what the Pasuk is talking about. So they say, It says, don't injure yourself on account of a dead, dead person. Don't, right? That's what it's talking about. Not agudot, agudot. So they say, classic drasha. Well, in came le makha lo tigodidu. Tigodidu means to cut, right? Tigodidu is to do it to yourself. But to cut, you could have just said, don't cut on account of someone dying. We assume you mean cut your body. My titko to do shmamina lach yudaata. So lo titko to do comes teach you something additional. Agudot agudot. To which the Gemara says ve emakule lach yudaata. Maybe it means titko to do means it's reflexive to yourself. Maybe it means don't make yourselves into agudot agudot. Or alternatively, different commentaries take different approaches. Or maybe it means don't mutilate your body only. In other words, either which way they're saying titko to do the reflexive is necessary to teach. What it's necessary for, either say agudot agudot or say mutilate the body, but but either which way, it doesn't really teach both things. To which they say, uh, right? So maybe the whole thing is for just that. 
אם כן, למכה לא תגודו, מה לא תתגודדו, שמה מן התרתי. Now say, ah, it's the second dalit in the word, just like litzror, the same kind of drasha. We said litzror meant two tzarot, the tzara and the tzara tzara. Could have just said latzul, here it could have said tagodu, which would have meant the same thing. Tigodidu comes to teach you double. So in the end, we learn both things and we're good with that. That was just an aside. Now comes the discussion of Rabbi Yochanan Mishlakish. I charted it out, kind of who says what. So here it goes. Rabbi Yochanan says back to him, Akan lo shanita. You didn't do your homework well. You're asking just about the Mishnah Megillah. Why didn't you ask about the Mishnah in Pesachim? This is a good review for us. Makom shna gu la'asot malacha ba'arabe Pesachim al chatzot osim. Makom shna gu shalo la'asot en osim. There's an Yisra Malacha, right? There's a different custom about not doing work on the morning of Pesach until midday. Are you allowed to work? You're not allowed to work. So if you come from a place where they do, you do. If you come from a place where you don't, you don't. That's the same thing as Purim. Why should there be any difference? So they say... Amalei Rish Lakish answers him, Amin ala ani isura. To Amor Rav Shem Bar Abba, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, the Kemi Kemi Apurim b'zmanehem, zmanim har beitig nu lehem chachamim. Vaat Amar Li Minhaga. He says, Why are you talking to me about Minhag when I'm talking about law? Now it's a little bit weird because he uses the language of isur. Isur is forbidden items. Now there's no forbidden items by Purim. That's not what we're talking about. But the way it's understood is, I'm giving you a law, as it says in the Begilla, b'zmanehem. teaches you, if you remember, there's Zmanim Herbe. There's multiple days on which to read the Megillah. So that's a law. And I'm saying, this law is problematic because it causes a good doubt, a good doubt. But I wasn't telling you about a custom. Customs, of course, you have one custom, I have one custom. That's not a good doubt, a good doubt. Nobody's bothered when someone does a custom differently than they do. They might be bothered when someone keeps halacha differently than they do. But they're not bothered when there's different customs. So he says, don't ask me a question from that. So now they say, Rabbi Yochanan is not satisfied with that answer. He says, That law about Isur Malacha on right, the morning, the custom not to work on Erev Pesach in the morning, that is based in law. How do we know this? It says in the Mishnah there, At night, the night of Yudalit, the night that we do B'dikah Chametz, the night before Pesach, There's a machloket, Bet Shammai Osrim, Ube Hil Mitirim. That's a language of Isur and Heter, right? Now, that's a language of law. There is some Isur Melacha on the night, on the day before Pesach, whether it starts at night, whether it starts in the morning, it starts at some point, and, there's, and that's a law. It's not just a custom. So, Amar Leh, he gives him a different answer. Why Pesach is different, why he wasn't bothered by that one. This we've seen before. Haro'e Omer Melacha Udilet Leh. He says, if I don't do work, and you're doing work, right, and I'm not doing work, it doesn't look like I'm not doing work. It just looks like maybe, you know, I didn't have work to do or something. So not working is not something that's so noticeable. So you see some people working, some people not working. Well, if you look at every day of your life, you'll see some people are working, some people aren't working. So it's not something noticeably different that we're going to say, oh, this, look at this split in the, in the law. Okay. So now, that was his first question on Mishra Kish, and we answered it. And we get to the second question. And it comes from our Mishnah. Ah, now here you're going to have a big split. You have some people who marry in one way, some people who marry in another. Let's go through the law again. So Beit Shammai says, all the Tzarot, right, if I'm Isra Erva, right, both of us fall to Yibum, to the same person, to the brother, and the brother is forbidden to me, right, let's say it's my father, I married my uncle, So then, the tzara, according to Beit Hillel, can't marry the uncle either, can't do yibum, is exempt, and can go marry anyone she wants. So according to Beit Hillel, she goes and marries anyone she wants without doing anything. According to Beit Shammai, there's no law of tzara, which means that that tzara marries the brother. Now, according to Beit Hillel, that's isur karet, because if you're not supposed to do yibum, the brother is eshet ach, It's the brother, the wife of your brother you're marrying. You're not allowed to do that. That's karet. The kids, according to Beit Shammai, in other words, if you go with Beit Shammai, according, if, you're, if you do Beit Shammai says, and she does yibum, if you're someone from Beit Hillel, those kids are mamzerim, because that's an isor karet. Okay? So now you're going to have some people calling these people mamzerim, some people not calling them mamzerim. The flip, I want to show you this, because we're going to see this again today, which is, If you look like Beit Hillel and she goes and marries someone without doing Yibum, Beit Shammai says you have to do Yibum. So if she marries someone else without doing Yibum, that's what we call an Isur Lav. 
It says, She can't go marry somebody else. The child is not a mamzer, right? The child is just a chayve lavim, which is not, there's no problem with that child in terms of getting married to somebody else. But basically, you're going to end up with this big split in the people. You think they're mamzer, you think they're not. It's not really a good situation. You think she can marry, they think she can't marry someone else, right? Creates a lot of problems. To which Rish Lakish answers with a very interesting answer. This is not what we thought originally. They had a big argument about this. But in the end, when it came to practice, right? They, they disagreed in theory. But when it came to practice, they disagreed in theory. For Rabbi Yochanan Amal, asu asu. Rabbi Yochanan says, what are you talking about? No, they did. And not only did he say they did, he could have just said asu. Asu asu, and, and, and they really did. In other words, there's a huge debate here. And this is a fascinating debate, which is really at the, at the, at the core of our halachic system, which is in the end, did Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel, they had this argument. But in the end, did they agree to... To di- did they agree to disagree? And basically, some people held like Beit Hillel and some people held like Beit Shammai. Or did it come down to the fact that there was a centralization of authority and in the end, Beit Shammai had to agree to Beit Hillel. And they had to stop marrying their wives the way they thought that Sarah couldn't do Yibum. She ended up going and getting married right away without Yibum, even though they really believed that she needed to do Yibum. So that's this big debate that's going to basically go throughout the next few Dapim, which is... Did they really do right for sure through tomorrow's daf? Um, I'm not sure if it's past that, but for sure through tomorrow's daf is going to be this issue of asu lo asu. We're going to try to bring proofs, okay? Not yet, but soon we're going to try to bring proofs. Did Beit Shammai really do according to their own opinion, like your Rabbi Yochanan said? Or did they not? Did they acquiesce to Beit Hillel? Okay, now you have to think about our Mishnah again. Remember what it said in our Mishnah. They, they married each other, right? And we thought they married each other because... Because they have respect for each other. They say, okay, we agree to disagree, and you think this, I think that, we'll get married anyway. Today we're going to see maybe not. Maybe it's because they agreed to marry, because maybe they didn't really, right? Beit Shammai, in the end, theoretically disagree with them, but in practice, they did exactly like Beit Hillel, and that's why they didn't refrain from marrying each other. So anyway, it's, it's many, there's going to be a few different ways to read our Mishnah. So now, the Gemara wants to point out, Uba Plukta Deravu this is a machlok between Rav and Shmuel. Also, not only Rabbi Yochanan Mishra Kish, Rav and Shmuel also. De Rav amar lo asu beit shamay kedivrahem, u Shmuel amar asu vasu. Okay, so Shmuel holds like Rabbi Yochanan, the beit shamay continued to do what they did, and Rav says they didn't. They did exactly what Beit Hillel said, even though they disagreed. Now the big question is, Emat, when is this machlok it? Okay, we all know, or maybe we don't, but we'll talk about it, that at a certain point, this heavenly voice came down and said, the halacha is like Beit Hillel, right? Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel argued for many generations, and then they said, well, you know, halacha ke Beit Hillel, and they determined the halacha goes like them. So the question is, what are we talking about here? Emat, when is this? If you say it's before the heavenly voice came down and said, well, then it doesn't make any sense to say, which opinion? My time and demand are lost to. Before the heavenly voice came down, there was no halachic decision, which meant if you held like Beit Hillel, you went like Beit Hillel. You held like Beit Shammai, you went like Beit Shammai. There would be no reason to think that Beit Shammai did like Beit Hillel. The Elalah Harbat called, and once the heavenly voice came down, well, my time of demand Amara Su. Well, then, of course, Beit Shammai didn't do according to their own opinion because the halacha was determined to be like Beit Hillel. Everybody held that way. So it doesn't make sense either which way. So now the Gemara is going to answer according to both. You can explain it both ways. How so? So, You can say it was before the Batkol, and it was a time when the majority of the people were Beit Hillel. So now what we have to come up with is, why is there a split? Okay? So even though it wasn't yet determined, the Halach is like Beit Hillel, it was a case where Beit Hillel were the majority. We know we always go by the majority, unless we're going to see. So, if Beit Hillel was the Rov, Laman Damar Lo Asu, those who said Beit Shammai didn't hold like their own opinion, Daha Beit Hillel Ruba. Well, why didn't they? Because Beit Hillel was the majority. So since Beit Hillel was the majority, they held like Beit Hillel. Laman Damar Asu, those who said Beit Shammai held by their own opinion, what was that? 
Well, hechi ki azlinim bataruba. When you follow the majority, hechi dechi hadadi ninu. It's when the majority. There's a group here. There's a group there. One has more people. One has less people. But in terms of their intelligence and their ability to learn, they're equal. But you might remember this about Beit Shammai. Hacha Beit Shammai mechadadei tfe. Beit Shammai were sharper, and because of that, the other group said, "Listen." It's true that Beit Hillel is the majority, but we only hold by majority when they're equal. And Beit Shammai have better learning capabilities. So because of that, we're going to hold like them. So that's the debate. So it's all before the halacha was determined, which is interesting to be saying they're described, right? They're talking about a debate of something that happened way back when, right? About whether Beit Shammai did like Beit Hillel or not. Either which way, it's probably a debate from way back when because the Amorim are already living. You don't really have people that are Beit Shammai, Beit Hillel anyway. But um, anyway, that's the first option. Some people say it was after the heavenly voice. And you, I see someone already wrote this in the chat. So as we say, Baruch she Kivant, or Kivant, I didn't see you wrote it, but Manda Amar Lo Asu Batko. Some people say, right, the, those who say Beit Shammai didn't do like their own opinion, it's because the Batko came out and said, you have to follow Beit Hill, so they follow Beit Hill. Umanda Amar Asu, those who say Beit Shammai continue with their own opinion, they're not. Heavenly voice came down. How could you do that? Oh, Rabbi Yoshua, he, ah, there was a debate and Rabbi Yoshua held. This comes up in the famous Tanur Rosh story in Baba Metzia. He holds, We don't hold by heavenly voices. So Beit Shammai said, listen, I know there was a heavenly voice that said we go by Beit Hillel, but we don't go by heavenly voices and therefore they continue with their opinion. Umanda, okay, so that's, that's the debate. Okay, so we now have a possible, possibly the debate was before the bad call, and it had to do with, do we follow Rove when there's other people that are smarter, and that was the debate, or it was after the bad call, and the debate is, do you follow the bad call or not? Now, before we move on, the Gemara is going to ask some other questions here. Umanda Amar Asu, okay, this is a question against Rabbi Yochanan and Shmuel, who said Asu, and that's going to be the first question on him, and then we're going to move back to Rish Lakish. Karina Khan Lotit Godidu. So now they say, well, wait a minute. According to you, Rabbi Yochanan, there's loted go to do. In other words, we're ending up with agudot agudot. You, you know, Rish Lakish resolved the agudot agudot here because Rish Lakish said it's not agudot agudot because Beit Shammai in the end deferred to Beit Hillel when it came lemaaseh, practically speaking. But according to Rabbi Yochanan, we're going to have a faction of Beit Hillel that are marrying their wives in a particular way. A faction of Beit Shammai that are marrying their wives in another way. Right? What could be more agudot agudot than having issues with marriage? I won't marry your kids. You won't marry my kids. That's a big problem. Even if you say in the end that, right, the Mishnah said they didn't, but, right, they worked it out. But even so, you still have people doing different things. So, Amar Abai. First answer is, Ki amrin lo titko didu, ki gon shte batei dinim bi'ir echat. We're now going to define when does lo go to do apply. He says, Abayah says, we're going to have Abayah, Machlok and Abayah, Rava. Abayah says, when we say lo go to do, we're talking about two courts in one city. That's a problem. When one court rules one way, another court rules another way, and within a city, we're going to have a, a split. That's a problem, right? It's so hard for us to imagine this in our modern day, right? We always have different opinions, and, and in a city, of course, now their cities were probably a lot smaller than our average city. Um... Right, but you know, we always have two shuls, four shuls, you know, however many in any given area, even a small community already, there's two shuls with two different rabbis and two different opinions about how how things are supposed to go. But in any case, right, he says it's two courts in one city. If you have one court in one town and another court in another town and they say different things, that doesn't bother us. So Beit Shammai Beit Hillel. Different cities, and then therefore it's not low to go to do. I'm really Rava. Rava says, "What are you talking about?" They're basically like two courts in one city. Why is that? So either because he thought they were in the same city, or because it's not like there was a city that was all Beit Shammai and there was a city that was all Beit Hill. It people lived all together. They were all mixed up. It wasn't wasn't that faction that we're not living in their city. We're not living in that city. There, every city had people that were holding like Beit Hillel and people holding like Beit Shammai. That's kind of like having two courts in the same city, which would be low to go to do. So it's not really a good answer, Abai. Comes Rav and he says, I'm going to redefine how low to go to do works. We're talking about a court in one city, one court. Plag morin kedivrei Beit Shammai, u plag morin kedivrei Beit Hillel. 
And when we have a court, we have to make a decision. Think about the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court makes a decision, even though a little more than half hold one way and a little less than half hold the other way, right? Usually that's the way it works out. And then you end up with, right, and they even write up their dissenting opinion. However, even though they write up their dissenting opinion, in the end, they all agree with the ruling. They, they, they respect the system. The system says this is the ruling and they're not going to go out of court and rule somewhere else like their dissenting opinion. No, of course that wouldn't happen. So that's what he says. If you have a city where half of them hold like Beit Shammai and half of them hold like Beit Hill, and they don't necessarily mean exactly half, right? But a group holds like them, a group holds like them, and then they go out and they teach according to their opinion, even though it wasn't accepted, that's lo go to do. Aval. But if there's one court that's Beit Shammai people and one court that Beit Hillel people and, and those hold like that one and those hold like that one, that's not low to go to do. They have someone to rely on, right? We can, we can agree to disagree. That's fine. That's not making it, things into factions. This is a great question, right? It's a great sugi because it gets at the core of, you know, what our Judaism is. And you see that they struggled with the same questions that we did, right? There's, there's different opinions. People do things differently. Uh, where does it cross the line between... Doing things differently, and I would say almost respectfully, right? And cre- feeling like we don't agree with each other and we're doing things very differently. Tashma. Okay, now we're going back. And before we get to this question to try to determine, did Beit Shammai continue in their way or did they not? Before that, we want to raise two questions on Rish Lakish about this issue of Lotit Godidu. So now we're going to say, this is, it's like Rabbi Yochanan could have continued to ask. Rabbi Yochanan started listing all these cases. Right? Now we're going to say, and especially based on what we just explained, Abayi and Rava, or we'll see, we're going to actually answer it according to Abayi and Rava, but Tashma, we're going to see places where there were factions that did things differently. And why Rish Lakish, according to you, that Lot did go to do with such an issue, how could this have happened? This is something we learned about, if you remember, there's a chapter in Shabbat called Perak of Elezer de Mila, it's Rabbi Eliezer's opinion about Brit Mila, where he says, and that's exactly what we're discussing here, he thinks that machshire Mila dochimit Shabbat. Not only can you do Brit Mila on Shabbat, but if you don't have a knife to do the Brit Mila, you can create a knife. You can cut wood to make the to make the fire, right? To make the, the coals, to make the barzel in order to create the knife, okay? You can even go that far back on Shabbat if you have to do a Brit Mila. And so in his city, this is what they would do, even though people totally disagree with this. We'll get to this in Chulin. Right? You can't eat meat with milk. But what about chicken? Right? Things that come from birds, can you? So he would do it. He would mix milk and chicken, not a problem. Right? No, people don't do this nowadays, but he held that you could. And in his city, people used to do that. So going back to the first line. Sounded like in Rabbi Lezer's city they would do it. In Rabbi Akiva's city they wouldn't do it. Titania, Klala Mar Rabbi Akiva, Kom Lacha Shepshar La Sutana Erev Shabbat, Ein Adochet Shabbat. Rabbi Akiva had a principle that anything you could have done before Shabbat, you could have made the night before Shabbat, you didn't. Tough luck, right? You can't do it now. So obviously they only did it in his city. They didn't do it in his city. There you see, Agudo Agudo. Why is this not a problem? To which the Gemara says, obviously, Vahai Mai Tsiufta. What kind of a question is this? We just said you could have one bait in one city, one bait in another city. That's not called factions. Likewise here. One city did one way, one city did another way. That's not a problem. So now when they have such an obvious answer, they say, well, what were you thinking in the first place when you even asked this question? You would have thought that since Shabbat is so severe that it was as if they're in the same place that it's not. Then it comes to teach you it's not an issue. Tashma, next source. To Rabbi Yavau, again, question on Rish Lakish, why is this not a gudot a gudot? To Rabbi Yavau, ki ikla la'atre de Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, hava metaltal shraga, ki ikla la'atre de Rabbi Yochanan, lo hava metaltal shraga. We're talking here about carrying the candle. What's a candle? It's not like we would say nowadays, you're carrying a candle. It's that little utensil. It was like a little uh, earthenware vessel. They would put the oil in and they would burn their candle. While it's lit, you obviously can't carry it on Shabbat because you might put out the flame. Right? You might cause kiboy, which is a malacha. But once it goes out, there's a machloket. Can you carry it or not? Is it muktzah? Because when you lit it before Shabbat, you it's called muktzah machmat isul. You intended it to be used 
in a way that you couldn't carry it. So basically, right, what, the way it goes into Shabbat, usually that determines its status for all of Shabbat. And it, it's kind of like you pushed it off and said, I don't plan to use this for anything on Shabbat because it's going to be lit on Shabbat. And therefore, you can't carry it even once it goes out. According to other opinions, you could carry it. So now, Rabbi Avahu did some and some. This is even weirder, right? It depended on where he was, how he behaved. So when he went to Rabbi Yashor ben Levi's city, he would do it. He would carry it. And when he was in the city of Rabbi Yochanan, he wouldn't. He, he would hold its mukta. So, again, hi, my kusha. Why is this even a question? Didn't we just say different places? We don't care. Right, you can do one thing, one city, one thing, one thing, and another. So they say, oh, no. What we meant was, and in fact, this question for Rabbi Yavah was nothing to do with our topic at all. What really we were asking, Anan Hachi Kamrina, Rabbi Yavah Hechi Avid Hachi, Vehechi Avid Hachi. How did he himself do one thing in one place, one thing from another? It's almost like being two faced. How could he have done that? So Rabbi Yavah, here's the answer. Rabbi Yeshua Sfirale. In other words, it's not that he changed his mind and waffled all the time. Oh, I hold like him or I hold like him. No. It's that he really held that it was permitted. Otherwise, he couldn't have just done it when he wanted to when he was in Rabbi Yeshua's city. But, Rabbi Yochanan, he had enough respect for Rabbi Yochanan that when he was in Rabbi Yochanan's city, he deferred to his opinion about the Salah issue and wouldn't carry it. To which the Gemara asks one more question on this, and then we'll get back to our topic. Vaika Shama, but what about his Shamash, who saw him moving his candle in Rabbi Shoban Levi's city? And maybe when he went to you know, Rabbi Yochanan, he might have seen him, it's almost like the Malacha thing, he might have seen him not moving it, but he didn't know it was intentional, that he wasn't moving it out of respect for Rabbi Yochanan. And then his Shamash might accidentally come to misunderstand. And when he's in Rabbi Yochanan's city, move the candle. So they basically answer, um, just like we said in our in our mission, right? That they told them he would tell his shamash, he would tell him that I'm doing it, I'm not going to do it in the city of Rabbi Yochanan out of respect for Rabbi Yochanan. He must have told him otherwise; it really could cause problems. So anyway, that's an aside. Back to our topic. So now we basically ask two questions on Rish Lakish here. If it's loaded to go to do, why are these issues not a problem? One had nothing to do with it at all, this Rabbi Avau story, because it was he himself that did two different things. It was just out of respect. And the first one we said was considered, it was two different cities, so it wasn't really a problem. Now we're going to bring attempts to answer the question, Asu or Lo Asu? Did Beit Shammai change their ways and hold like Beit Hillel, or did they do their own? So Tashma, let's try to learn from here. Quote from our Mishnah. Which one does this go according to? Okay, it's a little tricky. Differently than we thought. If you say they didn't do, Beit Shammai diverted, you know, deferred to Beit Hillel and did like them. That's why lo nimnu. That's why they married each other. They married each other basically because they all kept the same opinion in the end. And you might say, well, then you don't need to tell us that. All right, but that's what they say here. If you say asu, that they kept their opinion, well then, why am I loaning new? They should have avoided marrying each other. Now, who should have avoided marrying who? It only goes one way because of this kare lavim. I want to just remind you, okay? Beit Hillel says, I'll, I'll repeat this again just so you get this straight. Beit Hillel says that Sarah doesn't need to do Yibum and in fact can't do Yibum. So that she can go marry anyone she wants. According to Beit Shammai, that's an Isur Lav. She's not allowed to marry anyone she wants until she does Yibum. So for Beit Shammai, they could theoretically marry Beit Hillel's kids because Beit Hillel, it's just an Isur Lav and Isur Lav doesn't affect the children. But according to Beit Hillel, you can't marry the brother, you can't do Yibum, and Beit Shammai says she does Yibum. So if she goes ahead and does Yibum, it's Isra Erva, according to Beit Hillel. She's marrying her brother's, right, her brother, the brother is marrying his brother's wife, which is forbidden, Isra Karet, which means, right, only Yibum permits that, but there's no Yibum here, according to Beit Hillel. Beit Shammai thinks there's Yibum, so Beit Shammai says you can marry. According to Beit Hillel, those children are mamzerim, because it was an Isra Karet relationship. So let's read this inside. Bishlama Beit Hillel mi Beit Shammai mi Beit Hillel lo nimnu to bnei chay ve'lavim nimnu. Right, Beit Shammai we understand. Let's assume Beit Shammai kept their ways, so they could still marry Beit Hillel's people because according to Beit Shammai that's only a lav. 
Don't go marry someone else before you take care of Yibum. That's a lot of Their children, right, are not a problem. According to Beit Hillel, they wouldn't be allowed. If Beit Shammai continued in their ways, there's no way they'd be allowed to marry their children. Their children in Beit Hillel's eyes are mamzerim. If you want to say that maybe they didn't think that if you marry a forbidden relative, your children are going to be mamzerim, well, that's not possible. Because we're going to understand this line in and of itself a little bit further on in today's staff, but right now we're just going to explain it very simply. Even though they disagreed about who can marry who, they all agree that Isur Kare creates Mamzer, right? If it's Erva that's Kare, the children are Mamzerim. So clearly Beit Hillel agree with that, in which case it doesn't make sense. This is going to prove Beit Hillel must not have continued in their ways because otherwise there's no way Beit Hillel would have married them. So it must be, they didn't, right? They didn't continue in their, in their opinion. They, they basically went with Beit Hillel, practically speaking. But now the Gemara says, Lo, I'm going to explain it otherwise. And this is not a good proof. And this is what I think we mentioned this yesterday. They kept lists, okay? They knew that these people, this goes on nowadays, by the way, in the courts. The courts have lists that according to the Beit Din in, in, in Israel, and I'm sure this goes, I know this goes on in different cities as well, there's people that are on blacklist, basically. And they say, these people are blacklisted in our community. We think there's a problem with their conversion. We think there's a problem with their this. And they blacklist people that in other communities, people will marry. But in their community, people are blacklisted. It's a big issue, right? This is, if you talk about factions and what creates factions, it's this issue. So what they say here is there was a lot of respect between them. And Beit Shammai kept their lists of who is, according to them, was a Yibum case, that the Tzara married the brother, and Beit Hillel wouldn't approve of that, and they knew who their kids were, and their kids' kids, and they basically kept a list so that they would tell Beit Hillel, oh, you want to marry this person? You can't, okay? This person's on your blacklist, even though it's not on our blacklist, right? It's a little bit different than nowadays, because nowadays people don't often have respect for other people's blacklists. Those days, right, the idea is that they respected, and that was the, the Chiddush of the mission. And furthermore, they want to prove this in an interesting way. Okay, this is different from the way I read the Mishnah yesterday, right? Because the Mishnah, and I want to point out, this is a good example of, the Mishnah could be read in some other way. The Mishnah could be read as, they didn't care that they're Mamzerim according to their opinion, since Yeshua me the smoke that they're not. In other words, they respected Beit Shammai thought it was okay. So if you think it's okay, then I'll, I'll be able to do it as well, right? I'll give you a... a Totally other example, right? Let's say Sfaradim warm up food differently than Ashkenazim do on Shabbat. Okay, there's different laws about whether you can put things directly on the plata, not on the plata, right? Totally different issue. So let's say you go to a Sfaradi's house and they heated up the food in a way that you think is bishul, and they don't, right? Now, since they have someone to rely on and they hold this way. So the halacha is you can eat in their house, even though if you went to someone's house who actually cooked food that was, you know, really a problem, they cooked it on Shabbat, you can't eat it. Um, so in this case... Since they have who to rely on, so you can do it. So let's take that to Mamzerim as well, right? Even though they think, you think it's a Mamzer, they don't think it's a Mamzer. They married or did Yibum thinking it was permitted. So you view that as not a Mamzer case, even though your opinion is this. In order to create peace and live together with people, that's the simple reading of the Mishnah. But the Gemara doesn't understand it that way because they say, how can you possibly marry a Mamzer, right? So they think it must be that Bechamai must have right, must have basically kept lists and told them. How do they prove it? Interestingly, opposite what I thought, what I suggested yesterday, and, you know, I still hold by my opinion, but the Gebarah used this as their proof. So now, if, right, I have Caleb in my house and we have disagreements of opinion about whether this is pure or impure, I think it's pure, you come to my house to eat, you eat anyway with my Caleb, according to the simple reading of the Mishnah, right? But the way they read this is like this. who They want to use this as a proof that clearly they kept lists of marriage, they also kept lists of Caleb, right? Like I said yesterday, what kind of, you're going to keep a list of every Kli and if it became impure in a way that someone else might think it's impure, According to the way the Gemara reads this Mishnah, yes, clearly you would have kept lists because 
Otherwise, right, that's why people would eat in other people's houses and not worry about this. If you say that they didn't tell people, that would be crazy. There's no way they would have eaten on their kaling. Okay, it's interesting. Maybe because I don't live the world of Tumantara, purity and purity. It's hard for me to imagine, but maybe they really did. I mean, in general, we've discussed how they had to be so careful about who sat and who this and who that. And maybe they really did keep it not only who sat, who this, who that, but according to whose opinion is this okay and according to whose opinion is it not okay. Right? Again, I don't necessarily think that this has to be the shot of how to read the Mishnah because it does seem to me a little bit far-fetched. But you see how far the Gemara is going to prove their point. They think that there's no way that they would have done something that they thought was forbidden, which is interesting in and of itself. So Bishlama, now, now we're going to see here that Beit Shammai were the ones who generally said things were pure. Okay? Even though Beit Shammai usually is stringent, in these cases Beit Shammai was more lenient. So Bishlama Beit Shammai mi Beit Hillel lo nimnu. We understand very easily, even if they didn't keep track, that Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel, right, that Beit Shammai would eat from Beit Hillel. Because ditma'ot Beit Hillel Beit Shammai tahor ninu. Because they view anything that Beit Shammai is metami, they think it's tahor, pure. But ela Beit Hillel mi Beit Shammai lamad lo nimnu. But there's no way that Beit Hillel ate on Beit Shammai's plates, dishes, because they clearly think that many things that Beit Shammai thinks are, are pure are impure. And lalav, it must be So they basically use this proof, this second part of the mission as a proof that it must be they informed them because there's no way they wouldn't have informed them about the Tumantara and therefore for sure they informed them about the wives as well. To which the Gemara asks the obvious question, which is, Umay ume dahach mehach. Why are you saying it's obvious with the Tumantara, right? And less obvious with the other case. So they say, Mau kale itle ka'itla kamashmalan. When people get married, it's something that people know about, right? When Yibum is done, people know. These things are official ceremonies. When something becomes impure in my house, there's no official ceremony. Oh, yay, something became impure. Oh, let's cry about it now. Right? We don't have a big celebration that my neighbors won't know, right? Even if I had a big celebration, I screamed about it. Maybe my next door neighbor would know. But for sure, nobody else in my block is going to know. So that's something that's much more quiet. Therefore, it's much more obvious there that Beit, that each side must have told the other side. Or in this case, Beit Shammai would have told Beit Hillel, right? Likewise, in the marriage cases... You, now there, you prove it from here because if here they told them, they must have also told them in the marriage. Now you might have thought maybe they didn't tell them in the marriage. They just figured if you really care, Beit Hillel, you don't want to marry our people. Well, keep track of your records, right? You follow the records and then it's your business. But no, the whole chidosh here, and this is a whole different chidosh than before, in order to keep good relationships, they kept their own list and informed Beit Hillel so that Beit Hillel would know and they didn't have to keep their own list. They would keep track for them and then be respectful of their opinion in that way. Okay, so that was an attempt to prove, just go back, that lo asube chamai, in the end, they explained it, no, it could be asube chamai, and they informed them about it. Right? They tried to prove something which was really not the way we understood the Mishnah. Lo nimnu was basically because Beit Shammai agreed with Beit Hillel in the end, and they acted in the way of Beit Hillel, but then they proved, no, no, no. It's just that Beit Shammai informed Beit Hillel. Nobody thinks in the Gemara here, now it doesn't mean nobody thinks it, but in the Gemara here, nobody reads the Mishnah the way I did, which is they just didn't care, right? That they said, oh, Mamzerim to you, right? Mamzerim to us? Well, we're not going to call it Mamzerim because you don't think it's Mamzerim, right? And you did it thinking, right, in your halachic opinion, and therefore I can marry that woman because I respect your, uh, your way of disagreeing. So again, it's not the way it's understood in the Gemara, but it doesn't mean that the Mishnah couldn't be understood that way. So, you're asking about the conclusion. We don't have a conclusion. This was an attempt to prove lo asu. In the end, we read it as asu also, which means we don't really know. Okay, so now, before we go on and try to bring our second proof, which is probably all we'll get through today, um, because the third proof really just starts on today's stuff, and, and it's not even almost worth starting because we're going to end kind of without getting anywhere, so probably leave it for tomorrow. But... Um, but before we get to the second attempt to prove, and throughout tomorrow there's going to be many attempts to prove different sides of this argument, we're going to go off into this Devrei Rabbi Eliezer that we saw before. Even though they disagreed about whether the Tzah is supposed to marry Du Yibam or not. Modim, they all agree, She'em Mamzer Elamimishi Suro Isur Evava Anush Kare. They all agree, though, that the only case you're going to have a Mamzerim is when it's Kare. 
So man modim, modim means one side right, agreed with the other about this issue. So what on earth does this mean? Ilema, who, who agreed with who? Ilema, Beit Shammai agreed with Beit Hillel, Pshita. In other words, if you want to say, Beit Shammai agreed with Beit Hillel, that Beit Hillel's kids were not Mamzerim because it's not Isur Ar Erva. Well, we already knew that ourselves. You don't need a line to teach you that. Because again, what did Beit Hillel say? Beit Hillel says, we can go marry, that Sarah can go marry someone else without doing Yibum. That's an Isur Lav. So her children aren't Mamzerim. So there's no Chiddush there. It's obvious. Ela Beit Hillel, Beit Shammai. Well, it doesn't, Beit Hillel wouldn't say to Beit Shammai, we agree that your kids are, right, that your kids, here it seems to say that it's only going to be Mamzerim if there's Erva and Karet. Well, remember, there's no saying, well, it's only going to be a Mamzer if, right, and yours are not, yours are Mamzerim, according to us. Because remember, according to Beit Shammai, they married, that Sarah married the brother, and she's not allowed to marry the brother because she's exempt from Yibo. In which case it's current, in which case her kids are Mamzerim. This seems to sound like we're not thinking it's going to be a mom's hair case. So therefore, we have to go back to the first one, the olam beit shamay beit hilel, and the whole problem was, well, it's obvious. Ah, la fuke mi rabbi yekiva da amar, yesh mom's hair mechai velavim, kamash wala de ein mom's hair mechai velavim. There's actually a debate about chai velavim. Okay, rabbi yekiva holds. If you marry, okay, let's say any random yibum case, you didn't do yibum, you went married somebody else without doing yibum, that's Yisro Lav, your kids are Mamzerim. Okay, thankfully, we do not pass on like Rabbi Akiva. This would be a disaster nowadays when we have the, the, you know, the state of Israel and everyone has to get married through the Rabbanut. We'd have tons of people that are doing Chayvei Lavim, like let's say a divorcee with a Kohen, right? So nowadays it's a problem because their kids can't marry Kohanim. But their kids wouldn't be able to marry anybody. They'd be Mamzerim. Okay, it's very fascinating and a good question. Why Rabbi Akiva was Marbe Mamzerim? We're always trying to Limit mamzerim and not call it, right? But he felt that that's a mamzer case. Okay, so this is to teach you, modim, they all agree that if it's chayve lavim, it's not mamzer. That's because it's to teach you they don't hold like Rabbi Akiva. So, well, we thought it was obvious. Well, it's not so obvious because somebody disagrees. Okay. Tashma, second attempt to prove asu or lo asu. The first attempt, we thought lo asu, and then we just, we said basically it could be read as asu also. Now we're going to prove asu, which is again, means we're going to try to prove the Beit Shammai kept their own opinion. Tashma. Okay, this is a long list of machlokot the Beit Shammai Beit Hill have about women in marriage, okay? Meaning status. Are people married? Are they divorced? Now, it depends, right? How you hold is going to affect if the woman's married, well, then she's an Eshadish. And then if she marries someone else, there's going to be Mamzerim. If you think she's not married, then she can go marry whoever she wants, and then her kids are fine. These are huge issues that have huge ramifications. So even though they disagreed on all these issues, so Tzarot, that's our issue. Achayot is something in Daf Kafav that we'll get to, which is kind of saw the Mishnah, which is two, three brothers married two, two sisters and another one, and then they, they die, and then they fall. I think it's actually, I forget now which case it is. It's two... Brother, sorry, two brothers marry two sisters and then they have two other brothers and the two sisters die and they fall to Yibum to the two brothers and there's Zik, right? They're both Zikukim to the same person. Remember that? They have Zika and then each brother can't marry. Remember that's Asura Lezeh Muteret Lezeh, Asura Lezeh Muteret Lezeh. That was an outgrowth of it. But the Mishnah is four brothers, two brothers marry two sisters and then the two sisters fall to Yibum at the same time. There's like a car accident. They both die at the same time. The two sisters fall at the exact same moment to the two brothers. Each brother is supposed to marry two sisters, which he can't. So nobody does Yibum. The Mishnah then continues and says, what if they did? What if the brothers did Yibum to the women? Can they stay married or do they have to, do they have to get divorced? So that's the Machal Gebet Shammai Beit Hillel. So that's one. Okay. Next, Get Yashan. If we wrote a Get to get divorced and then we ended up going into me and my husband went in a room together alone. That's called a get yashan. We have to write a whole new get, okay? Because it's as if we kind of canceled the fact that we wanted to get divorced. Ubisafik eshet ish. There's different ways to read this. Rashi gives two interpretations. Both are kind of difficult. I'm going to read it the way of Rabbeinu Hanana, which is, which is those two cases weren't safik eshet ish. That's just a matter. Do you have to get a divorce? Do you have to redo the get? But 
this is an issue, all these issues coming up are issues where you'll end up with one opinion will say she's married and one opinion will say she's unmarried. That's going to create major problems. So let's say you get divorced and then you sleep with her in a in an inn in a room by yourselves. We don't know what transpired in the room. But there's a concern that maybe you slept together, in which case maybe you even slept together with the intent to remarry her. Now, if that's the case, some one opinion is to say that's Kiddushin. You basically married her. And some people say, no, it's not. You don't have to assume just because even if something did transpire, it was Lashem marriage and then you're not married. So according to one opinion, you need to get from that just by sleeping together in the same room. This is a debate about how much the value of the ring, what we use as a ring nowadays, or anything that you would betroth a woman with, does it have to be a pruta, according to Beit Hill? According to Beit Shammai, it has to be more than that. So let's say you betroth the woman with less than that. According to Beit Hill, you'll be married. According to Beit Shammai, you won't be married. So all these cases have ramifications for marriage. So now, even though they disagreed, lo nimnu Beit Shammai, mi lisa nashim, mi Beit Hillah, velo Beit Hillah, mi Beit Shammai, lelam dacha shechiba v'reut noagim zemzeh lekehem ha'shenemar, ha'emet v'ashalom ha'havu, a beautiful line. Right here, it says even more explicitly in our Mishnah to teach that love and peace went between them, love and brotherhood, and to teach ha'emet v'ashalom ha'havu. Truth and peace go together, right? Even though they don't. Right? Truth is one and peace is the other, and you have to work them through, and they agree to marry each other. Rabbi Shimon Omeel, and this is the important line for our purposes, they didn't, right? They were careful when, when it was, they didn't marry each other when they knew for sure. But when it was a doubt, they did. So now, what does this prove? I kept to their opinion. That's why they had to be prevented from Vade. But there would be no reason not to marry them if Beit Shammai in the end of, deferred to Beit Hillel. So now the Gemara says, wait a minute. Even if they did do it, we keep going through this, right? We understand why Beit Hillel would have been prevented. Because it's, it's mamzerim. Again, Beit Shammai didn't need to, right, seem like each side didn't, when they knew for sure. But Beit Shammai, what do they have to not marry women from Beit Hillel? Their kids aren't mamzerim, according to them. So they say, oh no, you're missing a point. All this time, we keep talking about the children. The children, the children, are they mamzerim or are they not mamzerim? But, like he says somewhere else, they're talking about the tzara herself. The woman herself, who, if you're, if they knew for sure that she was a tzara of an erva, so they wouldn't allow her to marry some other guy until she did yibum be chamai. Not the children. It's true if she does anyway, her children won't be mamzer. But they wouldn't marry that woman because they'd say that woman has to do yibum first. That's what they mean. Now they say, wait, we have a good question. What did Rabbi Shimon say? Only from when they knew for sure. If it was a doubt and they weren't sure, they would marry her. They're like, what do you mean? What do you mean? We have a whole lot. If she, let's say Beit Hillel, if they think Beit Shammai's kids might be mamzerim, what, they're going to marry them? No, you can't marry a suffix mamzer. If they didn't know anything at all, then they would marry them. Not if they had a doubt. If they thought that maybe it was a mom's hair case, they wouldn't. But if they had, they didn't have any doubt, then they would have done it. They didn't know anything. Why? Because in general, Beit Shammai would tell them. So therefore, only if it was stam and they didn't know anything, they could assume that if there was some issue, they didn't, when someone went to get married, they didn't check. Oh, were you a Beit Shammai? And did you maybe come from some marriage? No, that far they didn't go because they assumed Beit Shammai, there was this respect between them, they would tell them. So then they say, wait a minute. Rabbi Shimon seems to disagree with Tanakhama. So what's Rabbi Shimon coming to say? According to what you're saying, they had this brotherhood love between them and that's why they would tell each other and that's why you didn't have to worry if it was just Stam. Well, that's the exact same thing that Tanakhama said. right? Because Rabbi Shimon only came at the end there. So they say, ah, Hakamash Malan de Kula Rabbi Shimon. The idea is that Rabbi Shimon is the main opinion of that Braita. That's the whole thing is Rabbi Shimon. And therefore, it, there's actually not two opinions. Everyone agrees that, and then we also get to something different here, that if they knew for sure, or they knew there was a doubt, they wouldn't marry them. It was the whole beauty here was that they kept lists and that they were always telling them what the case is. Very similar to what we saw before. We still don't really have a proof, asu or lo asu. We're going to continue with this tomorrow and try to bring more proofs. Have a great day, everyone.